I'm Mike Leck, and welcome to Adventures in Scale Modeling. The National Museum of American History's Railroad Hall is great testimony to the role these powerful machines have played in our country's transportation as well as economic development. The arrival of a locomotive like this at a railroad station would create activity well beyond that station, and countless cities owe their beginning to the railroad. These heroes of the machine age had their roots in early inventions. In the beginning, power was supplied by steam. As we can see here, the firebox, which heated the water in the boiler, which created steam. This was followed by gas, diesel, and then finally electricity, which today supplies power for the world's fastest trains. Historic locomotives, besides being very large as we've seen here, are not always available. As a result, the museum must turn to master model builders to recreate the original in scale. These are fine examples of model building skill and create a three-dimensional presentation. The Stevenson's locomotive, called the Rocket, is one of our earliest steam engines. A full-size replica is on display in London, England, which gives model designers an opportunity to study it. We're going to build the same locomotive in our museum, as an exhibit on transportation would be incomplete without trains. The inventive spirit led to many improvements in trains. In the same approach, it is invaluable to modelers since they confront new problems with each new model. As we progress in our modeling skills, we develop them by attempting new techniques that don't always work out the first time around. However, with a little bit of time, patience, and creativity, we eventually accomplish them and then we're ready to try another one. Also, a good modeler is never afraid to try something new. So let's get back and start our Stevenson's rocket right now. The amount of detail we put into a scale model is dependent upon the model itself, as well as the amount of time and effort we put into it. Bill Devins, our master model builder, is in the museum workshop. Let's go down and join him and see what we can learn about super detailing models as we begin building a very early steam locomotive, the Stevenson's Rocket. During the construction process of the rocket, one of the things we get to highlight is the weathering of the finish. Bill, what kind of progress are you making on that? Mike, I'm doing pretty good. I've got the base coat on all of our major pieces. I've got the metal pieces here painted black. I've got the wooden pieces here painted yellow. And I've got these railroad ties that are just half logs painted brown. Yeah, I see you have them all separated out. Now what we're going to do to highlight the finish and weather it a little bit, bring out some of the detail, is wash these brown logs with some water-based paint. Looks like you have dirty water here. How are you making your wash work out? Well, it really is kind of dirty water, Mike. What we've done is taken some water and a little bit of the water-based paint here. Yeah, you just take the paint full strength into the water. Mix it up real light so that we have a, what we call a wash. It's a very thin paint. We're not trying to paint the logs black but just to shadow the dark portions. Yeah, it is very thin. And if we put that wash on, it'll seep down into the low parts of the log and hopefully leave the higher parts our original brown color. That seems easy enough to do. It Can is, Can I give Mike. it a try? Sure. This is neat. All right, just use your brush here. Now, is there enough of wash made for me? Try some of that. If it's too thin, okay. it'll beat up on you. All right, nope, and it's going okay. It goes down in there and really highlights the, uh, what do you call that, these little, the, the well, log Well, that's the part. wood grain, I guess. Oh, that's it, the wood grain. So that'll sink in there, and it'll give you kind of a shadow and a 3D effect so that you don't just have a brown piece of painted plastic. Now it's starting to look more like a, a piece of wood, maybe. Now, Bill, you painted this with what, uh, acrylics all the way or enamel? What did you paint? Well, we originally painted all the pieces with enamel paint. We were using the acrylic to make the wash because the enamel thinned down this much would eat away the old paint that we've put on. Ah, oh, so we'd ruin the, the finish underneath the logs. Right, you'd take the brown paint right off, or at least mess it up enough. Uh, you know, the not acrylic only that. paint, you can wash off. If you put too much paint on, you can wash it off. If you don't put enough on, you can add some more. And it won't affect the finish beneath it if we have already painted an enamel. Not only that, what we know about acrylics, we can put this aside to dry, and it'll dry much quicker. Let me put that aside now, because I have a question, Bill, about the uh, wheels. How did you do the wheels? Okay, now the wheels we've got painted yellow for the wooden parts, but the rims are a steel color. Okay. You can see here, where I've painted these wheels with our steel rims. Okay, what are we going to do to paint the wheels now? Now, I've got a couple of them here, Mike. You might want to try 
All right, let me give it a try. Tightening the rim on this one, we've got your steel color paint. This makes a nice little handy dandy tool here to hold the wheel, doesn't it? Right. So we good. don't. We want to have it supported by the brush so that we don't have to put our hands in the on the right, rim. So I use this full strength right out of the jar. Right. Okay. And I just put this on here. Because it's going on pretty easy, Bill. Yeah, just go around. You're doing a great job on that, Mike. Okay. And you can see. Sometimes now, you're going to go over the top with the brush. Yeah, I did. I did a little bit here. Uh, and we can scrape that off later. Now, I can control the brush pretty easily here, but I still... There, I did it again. I went over the top. I mean, is, there any other, is there any other technique you know about here? Mike, they've recently come out with these paint pens. Oh, As you can a... see, it's like a magic marker. Oh, it But it has like our enamel marker. model paint inside of it. Oh, so it's just... Just, it has a felt tip. Right. And it, it's just paint inside. It's just enamel paint inside. If you shake it up, you'll hear it's just like a spray bottle. Yeah, it's got it has, the a, agitator little, it has ball. a little agitator ball in there. So you mix that paint up. Okay, well, you're the expert. Demonstrate that for me. I'm anxious to see how this works. See, with this, we can lay on the finish much easier. Oh, I see. We just twirl the wheel around, hold the magic marker in there. And we'll get a nice sharp edge. And since the magic marker's tip won't run over the top of the rim the way the brush will, it's easier to control for these Let me tight give it a edges try. here. Yeah, this ought to be easy to do. Now the paint's mixed up. I know mm -hmm. I just take it and I just hold it against there. And just hold it against there and twirl the wheel around. Oh, so I hold the I hold the paint steady and twirl the wheel. That's probably the easiest way to do it. That is, the e that is very easy to do. See, and you can do the rim here, down there, if you want. You know, what's also nice about the paint pen is you have a way of controlling the paint so that it doesn't go over on top the rim. All right, this is great. Well, I'm going to set this aside to dry, and I'd like to know from you, Bill, do you use the wash technique for any other parts of the model? Yes, Mike. What we want to do is uh, highlight the wood grain effect on the yellow panels, because the yellow is awfully bright, and without some kind of color to break it up, it's going to seem like a toy when we get the model finished. Okay, so what are you going to do for us? So I'm going to take our same wash here that we used for the logs and kind of brush it in. Uh, now, see, now you're telling me you're brushing it in there, yet you're getting it outside the planking area. What's, what's happening there? Okay, well, there's another advantage of the water-based paint. Once we use this acrylic paint on top of the enamel, we can wipe this off, and some of it will stay inside oh, the see. grain there. Well, let me give that a try. I haven't done this step there before. Give me some paint. paint. Give me some paint. Wash that up. So it's nothing more than acrylic paint and a lot of water. Right. It's sort of like playing with dirty water. This is the real fun part. <laughs> People come by and say, Bill, you're painting your model dirty. And that's really what we're doing here, isn't it? Exactly. See, we want to make the model look like a used vehicle once it's put, ready to put in the display. We don't want it to look like a toy model. You know, because this paint is so thin, it, it really goes down inside the crevices very easily. And the way we clean it up, uh, I don't know. I really got a mess on my hands here, Bill. All right. Well, you got this a little messed up. Let's see if the tissue will just take it off or not. Uh, it looks okay. But, you know, you still have a lot of... Is there, is there, okay, now, have we, we ruined that piece? We have to redo it? No. We can use something stronger than just water. What do you got for us? Just let me get the household spray cleaner from the sink here. Just ordinary household cleaner? Whatever. And we'll uh, shoot some of that on here. Now, you sprayed it onto the, the tissue first. Right onto the tissue. Okay. And now, this should take off our excess paint and yeah, hopefully leave some of it there in the cracks. Once again, the, uh, the bathroom cleaner is not going to react with the enamel paint underneath, but with the water-based acrylic paint still being fairly wet, it will remove it. Ah, that's a very clever technique so you just there, showed us, Bill. You can see we have the, the other side finished, and now you've got your planks defined, and the model should look a little more realistic when we finally get it put together. Okay, our wooden ties are dry now, Bill. What are we going to do to those? Okay, now, Mike, to accent... The high points of the grain, we're going to use a technique called dry brushing. Okay, what do we do there? Well, this is exactly the opposite of the wash that we did. What we're going to do is take our brush and put paint 
acrylic paint once again right from the bottle on the brush. Okay. And we want... But you're using this now full strength. Right. Now, the reason why this technique is called dry brushing is because we want the brush almost dry. Now, so understand I'm, here. Now, you're painting the card. Right. I'm not actually painting. What I'm doing is wiping a lot of the paint off the brush onto the card. So 90% of that paint's on that card, not in your right. brush. Right. Now, we've got a fairly dry brush. Ah, I understand. And what we're going to do is wipe it over the wood grain. You know, and you know what, it, pieces. what it's doing then, basically, is highlighting the ridges of the log to make it really look like a log. That's right. There you go. A and very... that'll pick up the high points, and it'll leave our wash that we put on earlier down in the low points of the logs. A very easy technique. Bill, while you continue to paint the logs and continue to finish up the weathering on the model, why don't we go and visit with Jeff Bechtold to learn about the future of railroading with superconductivity. We're building one of the famous steam locomotives of the past, the Stevenson's Rocket. But not all great moments in railway history have occurred in the past. Why? Well, because scientists and inventors are working on a promising breakthrough that will revolutionize rail travel as we know it today. We have a great treat in store for you today because we're in the laboratory of Dr. Paul Chu with Jeff Bechtold. Jeff is a member of the research group here working on superconductivity. We're going to see an experiment later on that promises to make trains of the future fantastic. It will revolutionize them more than the steam locomotive did for the railroads of the past. Let's go on over and talk to Jeff now. Jeff, welcome to Adventures in Scale Modeling. Welcome to the lab, Mike. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Well, what we're interested in knowing is, Jeff, what is superconductivity? And more importantly, how will it change the future of railroading? Well, Mike, superconductivity is a state of matter that is characterized by two important phenomena. One is the complete loss or complete absence of electrical resistance in the material. And the second is the Meissner exclusion of magnetic flux. The Meissner exclusion of, uh, we can't even say it. We, we need to know more, Jeff. OK. It's really not as complicated as it sounds. In the superconducting state, a material is able to mirror a magnetic field so that as we bring a magnet near the material, it will behave in such a way as to create a magnetic field in opposition to the magnet that we're bringing in close to it. And this opposition is like a North Pole to a North Pole, and it will cause a repulsion. But, Jeff, uh, railroads don't operate with magnets now, do they? They don't now, but they can. There's a prototype built that operates with magnets, okay? And it's based on two principles on the principle of repulsion that I just discussed with you, and on attraction, which magnets will also do when it's the South Pole to the North Pole. There's an attraction. The first principle is the repulsion, and that will be able to uh, raise the train above the tracks, the whole train. And then the principle of attraction will be able to pull the train along the track. Well, what kind of speeds are we talking about here? We're talking about speeds that up to 350 miles per hour. Whoa, can you imagine traveling on a train 350 miles an hour between your destinations? Well, the question is...